Mere replicant version 1.22474487139. is an enhanced 2021 re release of a 2010 Japanese exclusive replicant version of a PlayStation 3 video game called Nier. In both versions of the game, you play in a far future aftermath of a cataclysmic event that originated from the fifth ending of a PlayStation 2 game called Drakengard. The original Western Gestalt version of the game did not sell well when it came out, but the popularity of the 2017 Nier Automata is what ended up creating a new fanbase for the series, and that is how a remake with similar gameplay ended up in production by Square Enix and Toy Logic. The game was released on April 2021 for PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and on Steam, along with a free For Your DLC tie-in from Automata. And looking at how it took me 37.6 hours to finish trying to cover everything necessary for my usual recap format is going to make me do this in probably 4 videos, which will all be dedicated to focused parts as a recap of the game's story. Just like how it ended up happening with Automata, but with more focus on it this time. Grab some snacks, take a comfortable sitting position, and let's dive into this emotional roller coaster that is near. The following is a record from the weapon stories of Fool's Lament and Iron Pie, which should give some insight on how the slow burn apocalypse we find ourselves in the game's opening took place. Until I make the part 3 video, which will be more focused on the lore of the game, this is all the background information I'll be providing in this recap review series on where we are and why the game starts out like this. Feel free to use your imagination for the parts where I'm not using visuals. June 6th, 2003. Approximately 1500 hours. A massive white humanoid, initially called the Weapon, but since renamed the Giant, falls from the sky above Tokyo Shinjuku Ward, inflicting tremendous damage. At the same time, a large red creature, henceforth referred to as the Dragon, appears and engages the Giant in combat, though both the nature of its attacks and their utility remain unclear. As the self-defense force contemplates the methods by which they might attack the target, the government establishes a Bureau of Emergency Countermeasures. June 12, 2003, approximately 1600 hours. The giant, which was locked in a combat with the dragon, suddenly begins to collapse for reasons unknown. The dragon is then shot down by the 6th Division, the 303rd Squadron of the Air Self-Defense Force. No official record exists on who issued the order to attack the dragon. Work is begun to retrieve the remains of both the giant and the dragon, but no official verification has ever been made regarding which organization performed the retrieval. December 2003. The first case of the white chlorination syndrome is confirmed in Tokyo Shinjuku Ward. July 2004. Humans continue to turn violent due to the white chlorination syndrome, with fighting growing increasingly intense in infected regions. With the cause of the disease still unclear, the infected are isolated and violent riots suppressed by the force. Main thoroughfares are sealed and rain transportation is halted, later leading to all of Shinjuku being sealed off. At this time, the prospect of asking the American military for a non-official intervention is considered, but the government defers. Meanwhile, research begins on mesoparticles obtained from the giant and the dragon, as well as countermeasures for the white chlorination syndrome. This research ultimately leads to the founding of Project Gestalt a decade later. After this, there is a 49-year-long gap in the record on what happened. May 21st, 2053. We've finally run out of money. Food just costs a lot more nowadays because of the war. We tried begging at the church, but they have their hands full of caring for the wounded and can't spare anything. Jonas really lost a lot of weight. I wish we could get her something to eat. July 15th, 2053. We met a nice lady who gave us some food. At first I thought she was a homeless like us, but she said she was joining some kind of relief and support thing run by the government, so we decided to go with her. At least Jona seems to be doing okay today. August 1st, 2053. The nice lady from before used a book and turned into a monster. We ran as fast as we could because I don't think she's human anymore. Everything those adults told us was a lie. They won't give us money and they won't treat Jonas' illness. Also, there's a huge wall around the city now and we can't get out. We never should have come here. 
August 5th. It's so cold today. I can't believe it's summer. I can actually see my breath. We decided to hide from the monsters in an abandoned supermarket. We found a few old cans of food there, but now those are gone. Also, Jonas Koth just won't quit. I've got a really bad feeling about this. And that is all the setup the game itself has to explain how we find our main character, whom we can name however we want, in this abandoned quickie mart with this book and his younger sister Jona. The main character, whom I named after myself and will be referring to in first person in gameplay sections, comforts his sister until he hears more of those monsters from before coming and tells Jona to hide and not touch the books in the store. However, getting his ass handed to him by the monsters causes him to reach out for the black book and get magical powers to channel from it. Now we get a proper first fighting tutorial in fighting against the monsters with our iron pipe and the magic from the black book. While the main character keeps on leveling up from the low little one leveled character all the way to level 30. But then we hear Jona coughing in the abandoned store and rush to find her having touched the other black book, which has caused her to... You know what? I let this scene speak for itself. You've always been the one helping me. So I just wanted you... No. We need help. Please, somebody, we need help. Help us! And then the game jumps 1412 years into the future, and I tell you to forget everything you just saw until I remind you to think about it again. Now we are living in something of a typical JRPG surroundings, where our main character and his sister Jona are living in a two-story house near a library and a single district village. Jona is still sick like she was in the beginning, and our main character narrates that the world is not doing any better than she is. Supposedly the world is dying, and everyone is just doing their best to make most of the time they have left. And those creatures from the opening prologue are running around while our main character is doing all kinds of odd jobs to get money to make his ill sister live more comfortably. On the first day when we are introduced into this life, we go to get a hunting job from one of the village's elders, Popola, and catch our sister out of the bed at the library where Popola has her office. Yona? Oh, hey. Yona, you're supposed to be in bed. See, now your ribbon's all undone. I'm sorry, I just thought I'd see if the library had any books about how to cure my sickness. Yona, look, don't worry, you're gonna be fine. You just need to eat and rest. If you take good care of yourself, you'll get better. You really think so? I know so. Anyway, I've got work to do, so I need you to head home. Deal? Deal. During his hunting job, our main character comes across these shade creatures, kills them before they get to kill anyone, and then reports his job done to Popola before returning home to Yona. Before turning in for the night, the main character tells Yona a bedtime story about a legendary flower called Lunar Tear, which could help them get a fortune needed to cure Yona from her illness. The next day goes pretty much like the previous one, but after returning home from work, we find Yona gone and can't find her at the library like yesterday. After talking with Popola, the main character realizes that Yona must have gone looking for lunar tears, which Popola had told her used to grow near the lost shrine in the northeast of the village. And after discovering Jonah's ribbon, we rush to the Lost Shrine, which is visibly a ruin of a modern-day building in this post-apocalyptic world. After running through that dungeon and fighting the shades, we find Jonah being guarded by two sentinels sealed in place by a white book, which after beating up enough times comes loose and introduces us to one of the best characters in this game. <sighs> For the love of all that is holy, would you please stop pounding me? This book... I am Grimoire Vice. My very name brings kingdom. 
hands to their knees. Sorry, Grimoire Vice offers his magical services to us, but unfortunately all that pounding given prior to his release causes him to get amnesia to all of his magic powers and how to use them. Fortunately, Vice absorbs essence from the shades and regains some of his powers to help us lay Hansel and send Gretel to lick his wounds. Then once we reach Jona, the entire place begins to shake down and forms the three of them to flee from the Lost Shrine, which will be locked out until the second half of the game. And then Jona's condition takes a turn for the worse. I tried, I really did, but I couldn't find a lunar tear. And I'm so sorry. I, I just wanted to make you rich and get rid of this disease. I'm sorry. Don't worry about... <sighs> Jonah? What's going on? After getting her back home, Grimoire Vice tells us that he recognizes Jonah's symptoms as the Black Scroll, which now has given our sister a countdown on her remaining days. Leaving Jonah to rest, Vice tells us that he would help our sister if he knew how to, and then that way how he could help comes when we meet up with Devola, the other elder of our village and Popola's twin sister. I was worried about you. I heard you went through the Eastern Gate and... Wait, is that a book? Now see here, I am Grimoire Vice and you will treat me with the proper respect. Wait, you're Grimoire Vice? Oh, that is so cool. Hold on, what? You know him? Of course. He's the white book I was just singing about. He's in your song? Yeah. The Song of the Ancients. It's an old tomb that's been passed down through generations of villagers. It's in a forgotten language, so I doubt you could make much sense out of it. Do you know what it means? Well, it's not like I studied it or anything, but I can tell you bits and pieces. Basically, the song Devola sings on her free time is about a black book, Grimoire Noir, who spreads disease, and a white book, Grimoire Vice, that then defeats it. Since Vice is supposedly that white book, we recognize the logic from that song being that Vice could be able to heal Jona if he wasn't amnestic. At the Devola's advice, we go ask if Popola has some more concrete information about Vice and learn that the two books would fight each other with sealed verses, which are the forms of magic that we now need to look for across the land. And seeing how Vice got his last two magical attacks from the shades we killed at the Lost Shrine, logic suggests that killing more shades will restore his powers. Popola suggests that we start our search on the verses at an isolated village of the Airy, which is northwest of our village. Unfortunately, there we are just told to go away by the very rude locals that just make us realize why the place is isolated. Fortunately, on our way back from there, we come across a flower ornament made from lunar tears, and taking a closer look at it, we then meet on another fan-favorite character in this game. Hands off the flowers. Uh, Vice? Why is that lady in her underwear? I fear we have greater issues to deal with. And this is what the father character said in that 2020 game. Hands off the flowers. That's, uh... Quite the outfit. I fear we have greater issues to deal with. This hussy, as Vice will eventually take up calling her, tries to intimidate us off from her property, but then we recognize that she is possessed by a shade and have to fight her because we are hunting shades. Before this fight eventually gets cut into by a larger shade, let me point out that the hussy never initiates any fight before we attack her and only stands in a defensive stance. And then this large shade attacks and the hussy turns her attention into it very aggressively in telling us to stay back. Even then we help her until the large shade eventually leaves and knocks her out. So as gentlemen, we help her back into her house and the least we get as thanks is her telling us that her name is Kaine, along with a warning not to try kill that large shade because she called tips. 
We don't give any promises because later Vice lets us know that there must be a sealed verse in that shade, which we might need to restore his memory and magical powers. Going forward in the story, when reporting about the area to Popola, she recommends us to go to the junk keep in the north to upgrade our weapon. That place is run by two brothers, Jacob and Gideon, whose mother Blue has been missing for a whole week. So after we have to go get some materials from what is probably an old factory still making robots, we offer to go search for the boy's mother from the deeper levels of the junk keep. I can't possibly believe their mother managed to fight her way down here. For that matter, that she has been collecting scrap metal for a solid week. Open your eyes, lad. The woman is clearly... She's alive. Miracles don't happen if you don't believe in them, okay? Miracles. That kind of optimism is then what gives us the strength and courage to fight the junk heap's defense system, which by the way is fittingly named Gebetto and looks like a puppeteer. By the way, this part of the boss fight has a hilarious meta line. These chambers are loaded with bombs. It's working! Unbelievable. Such an obvious weak point. And after winning that boss fight, we end up finding Mother Blue dead, along with a man with whom she was planning to leave her children. The game gives us an option to either tell the boys the truth or lie. I ended up telling the truth, which the older brother appreciated, while the younger one ended up throwing a tantrum. Liar! I don't believe you! And then we decided to be a good big brother by going to see how Yona is doing home alone. Yona, what is it? It hurts. Oh, Yona. I'll go get some medicine, okay? Just hang on. Wait. What is it? Just don't do anything dangerous. Stop worrying already. Seeing our sister in pain, we run to ask Popola if she knows how to ease it, which then sends us to run to the seafront south of the village with, for a summon fish. And at this point, in order to not pad this too long, I should probably acknowledge how much and little there is happening here in the story. See, there is a reason why this game was split into a young boy and a young man halves, which is also why I'm doing this review as a four-parter. This childhood portion is made to resemble your typical JRPG, to lull us into a false sense of security in this calm state of normal, in which we have a nice house to live in, and the life in this village is not very hard. Also, this seafront where we go look for this summon fish meant as a pain medicine for Yona, looks like it's a holiday location. After being taught how to fish and getting the medicine fish, this old woman at the lighthouse forces us to act as her mailman by visiting the post office. Postman Hans also gives us a letter to deliver to Popola along with the lighthouse lady's mail, which after delivering we then rush on a hog ride back home, where the shaman fish and a good night's sleep nurses Jona back to health. Hey, what's that book? Oh yeah. Guess I should introduce you. I am Grimoire Vice, wielder of Arcane. Oh, hi, Vicey. N now, see here. My name is. Vice has been worried about you, too. Really? Aw, oh, thanks, Vicey. It appears impudence is the fruit of this family tree. Delivering Popola that letter from the seafront, we learn that more shades have been appearing at the area where we now have to return, and by the way, in the loading screens, when coming and going from different places, we have gotten pieces from Jonas diary in helping us as the player know more about her. But now when leaving the library to go to the Airy, we get a photonegative damage report set between the two weapon stories I read in the beginning. Arriving to the Airy, we team up with Kaine against the big shade we fought against previously, and Kaine really shows how much she wants to kill it. Keep your guard raised. As if there were any other choice. Rot in hell, you fucking asshole! Uh... Did you just say what I think you said? Tear out your goddamn eyes and piss in the sockets! Oh, sweet lord! I have never heard such a thing. As we fight this thing, however, it suddenly begins to talk in an older woman's voice that Kaine recognizes as her grandmother. But if the Shade was trying to stop her fighting in that way, then it failed miserably. 
Kaine? Is that it? Hmm? Are you finished yet? Don't speak to your grandma like... You're going to stop talking now. And then I'm going to slowly walk over to you, cram my hand inside your goddamn bitch-ass chest, and pull out your fucking heart! It was the audience voice. Say that. She'd never tell me to give up on life. Never! I've spent my entire life searching for a way to avenge her death. She gave me the strength to deal with this goddamn mutant body. Do you know how long I've been like this? How much I loathe myself? And the rest of the fight goes on until we stake that shade before going to ask Kaine if we are friends now. I had my revenge. Oh, now, see here, this is rich. Vice! We help you in some mad quest for vengeance, and now you think to bid us adieu? A true warrior would fight. They would give all in the service of their friends. Friends? That's right. He's right. Kaine, we're friends now. Oh, see here, that was hardly the point. Kaine! We need your help. Will you fight with us? Fool, you cannot simply ask her outright. There is a proper order to these matters. One must ease into the topic with carefully considered words before- I can't just live for revenge. You mean, you're coming with us? These swords of mine need a true home. But you'll do for now. As Kaine joins us, we also manage to obtain a sealed verse for Vice to regain his powers. And in telling her about Yona, Kaine lets us know that she knows a far away king who has been suffering from the same illness. However, in going there through our village, Kaine tells us she won't be entering it and will join us when we leave it from another exit. After doing some errands in the village, we join Kaine again in making our way to the kingdom on the desert in the east, and run into a pack of wolves who are eventually called away by the pack leader. Thanks to having Kaine with us, we gain access to the kingdom of Fasad, where the locals wear masks and speak a language that even Vice is unable to understand. With the language barrier keeping us from getting anywhere, we are about to leave the place. But then we run into a local girl, who communicates with sign language and gestures that Vice is able to understand. The girl is so introduced to us as Fyra, and she agrees to give us a proper tour of the kingdom while also explaining the rule-based hierarchy they have. Which I'm just going to summarize as not being a list of restrictions, but also a list of freedoms the locals also have. At the end of the tour, Fyra takes us to the king's mansion where we unfortunately learn that the king suffering from the Black Scroll has passed away already, and we made our way here for nothing. On our way to leave the kingdom, we hear that the prince, who is supposed to be their next king, has gone missing at their sacred temple, and that their rules forbid them from going after him. So long story short, we along with Kaine and Fyra as our guide, make our way to that temple, where the rule system of facade forces us to get through the rooms without doing anything forbidden by the rules. Kaine gives us a good example on what happens if we don't play by those rules. God damn it! This shit's starting to piss me off! <clears throat> oh, are you fucking kidding me? Let me go! Let me. I'm gonna kill you when I get out of here! Two examples of rooms that I dislike the most are this 2D platformer that makes me empathize with Anakin Skywalker. I don't like sand. It's coarse, and rough, and irritating, and it gets everywhere. And this room where running, dodging, and using vice for magic is forbidden. Ultimately, we reach the end of this Zelda dungeon, reunite with Kaine, beat the boss made from cubes, and find the prince to be king of facade, who has found the mask that makes him be seen as the king. Returning to Facade, the prince is named as the king, and as thanks for helping him, we are given the forever welcome ticket to the kingdom, and Fyra is recognized as someone who can now rise from her caste to be recognized by the king. 
Unfortunately, the king also lets us know that he has no idea how to heal the Black Scroll, so it's back to searching for those sealed verses. But for now, it's the time we return home and be there for Yona before she goes to sleep. And at the night, we see text scrolling kind of dream that the next day sends us to the forest of myth. I actually read all of these text stories out loud when I played the game, so comment down if you want me to edit out mistakes takes from it and post separate videos where I read them. Otherwise, I'm just going to say that this place will be important for part 4 and move on. After returning from the Forest of Myth, Popola asks us to go look for a contractor she hired to build the game's fast travel system. I mean, the ferry canal. And this part was actually something that was added to 1.22474487139... version of the game that was not in the 2010 Replicant version or on Gestalt. And for that reason, I'm not going to spoil this unnamed couple, only known as the Redback couple, because you need to experience them on your own, and I don't want to pad this video longer than it needs to be. Anyway, that got the contractor to resume working for Popola again, and before reporting back to her, we have to go have meal Yona promised to us. Hey Yona, I got your ingredients. Yay! Okay, hold on, I'm gonna get started right- Yona, wait, be careful not to boil it too long, okay? Come on, I never forget that. I recognize most of the ingredients, but the chunks of meat are so big, I don't think they cooked through. Eat up! Okay? Sure, Yona. It looks, um, great. Tomorrow, Yona's not gonna be the only one here who's sick. After that dinner, we go report back to Popola and notice someone loitering outside the library. I'm coming to see you today, Popola. I promise. You After giving Popola a warning about her possible stalker, we return to Yona, who tells us that while we have been away, she has gone and gotten herself a boyfriend that she has been writing letters with, and the latest one has been asking for us to go meet up with Yona's pen pal. Wait, Yona's got age. a boyfriend. Is something amiss, lad? Your voice is trembling. No, it isn't. Shut up! It turns out that Jonas Penpal lives in a huge mansion located between our village and the seafront. We are received by a valet of the place, which must have been inspired by the Spencer mansion from Resident Evil, and brought to wait for the master of the house in the dining hall. Their Kaine is comfortable enough to take a nap, and when we decide not to wait anymore, Vice reveals himself to be scared of hypothetical ghosts. Like this one bit. What's the matter, Vice? Scared? Uh, perhaps we should head back, yes? Hmm. Hey, where'd Kaine go? I knew this was a terrible idea. Haunted manners and the like. Oh, why does no one ever listen to me? Help! Get me out of here! What's this? The picture has changed. Eventually, after admiring all the statues in the courtyard, we follow the piano music and find the blind master of the house ourselves, Emil, who claims not to have invited us here at all. So now we need to go look for that valet who let us in the house, and why did he act like we were invited? By the way, note how Emil has a blindfold to make himself blind. That is because he is blind by choice, from being like a male gorgon, by being able to turn everything he glances at into stone. Which helps us fight against the shades as they appear in the mansion in groups, and turning them into stone for us to destroy easier. Which means that those statues on the courtyard were not statues, but rather people who have been turned into stone by Emil. When we find the valet, whom Emil names as Sebastian, he is revealed not only to be a robot, but also the one who wrote those letters to Yona. And before we even get to call out Sebastian as a creep, he explains that he tried to reach out to us after learning of our exploits in wanting us to clear out the Library of Shades and retrieve a book that would have a cure for Emil's stone gaze. If there is such a book in this manner, then surely it could also help Yona and maybe also help Vice get his memory and powers back. 
Well, of course not. That would be too easy. Instead, that red book turns out to be the end of the dungeon bus, where Kaine returns to us after her nap time, and after we defeat it, one of the pages that flies out of it seems to be a report based on Emil's petrification case. And defeating that red book also nets us on another sealed verse, meaning that Vi should now have his powers back to help Yona, if he were to remember how to use them. As we leave the mansion, Kaine and Emil have a moment talking about how... Emil, listen to me. What is it, Kaine? Your eyes are not a sin. Don't ever be ashamed. They're a vital part of you. Do you understand? What's this? A shade? How did you... Oh, is an accursed weapon. I thought I would only need it until I had earned my revenge. Once that happened, there's a reason I'm alive. Arm is alive. And there's a reason for your eyes, too. Kaine! I have a theory on what Kaine could have possibly told Emil in this fashion here, but you're going to have to wait until the third part of this review series for me to explain it in proper context. Anyway, now we have all the needed sealed verses that we set out to find in restoring Vi's magical powers. Devola decides to convince Popola to join her in performing a duet of the Song of the Ancients to see if it can help Vice. Such an unusual sound. I feel like I could listen to this song forever. I hear that. Funny how she can't sing it unless she has that crazy drink, huh? song comes from, and yet, somehow it feels oddly familiar. Oh, so beautiful. Reminds me of back when I was a lot younger, it does. Prettier, too. Well, that was fun. Hopefully it won't be so long until the next time. And then, right after that concert, Emil stumbles into our village, passes out at the gates, and when he is taken to Popola's library to rest, Emil gives an exhausted warning about the shades being on their way to attack the village. Air, it's vibrating. I can feel it behind my eyes. So much pressure. God, there's so many of them. Get out. Get out of the village. The shades are coming. And would you know it, that is when the shades break through our gates to attack. In running towards the attacking forces, we run into Devola, who promises to take Yona to the library with everyone else taking refuge there. And then this colossal shade joins the fray as the mid-game boss. After we have weakened it enough, Kaine gleefully joins the fight. Underestimate us at your own peril, fiend. Keep hitting it! At some point, it's gotta start working! Is she trying to raise our morale, or is she honestly that insane? Either one works for me. Let's go! It's heading toward the library! No, that's where Yona is! You're gonna die today, shithog! Shithog, oh, come now, that's not even a real word. Looks like you've learned how to swing that thing. I'm glad you noticed. You really know how to put a fight, Kaine. Come on, keep pushing it! You stubborn son of a bitch! Huh? 
At the library, Emil has joined us in using his petrification gaze to turn the shades into stone and make our job easier. But then, despite our best efforts, that shade sends its cut-off head to fight us in the library, knocking Emil out and ends up being such a tough opponent that Vice ultimately suggests that we lock it down to the rock-hard stone walled basement of the library. We do that, and Kaine holds the door, but before we can lock the door leading down there, this happens. Dear God. Yoda! This shade which bears a striking resemblance with our main character, makes a strong first impression after stabbing us into the back, taking Yona, and having all the other shades bow to it. And it also has a black book similar to the one we had in the opening prologue, that Devola mentioned was also in her song earlier. Vice is pulled into what I assume is a telepathic conversation with the Black Book, who introduces itself as Grimoire Noir, and attempts to nudge Vice's memory with truths he doesn't want to hear, and pressing that the two books should unite to become one. This is how they are supposed to serve the Shadow Lord, aka our lookalike, in releasing the shades to the world. Vice is petrified by this mindfuck until he hears us and Kaine calling out to him from the real world. Kaine. Start making sense, you rotten book, or you're gonna be sorry! Maybe I'll rip your pages out one by one, or maybe I'll put you in the goddamn furnace! How can someone with such a big smart brain get hypnotized like a little bitch, huh? Oh, Shadow Lord, I love you, Shadow Lord. Come over here and give Vice a big sloppy kiss, Shadow Lord! Now pull your head out of your goddamn ass and start fucking helping us! <sighs> One with the shadow, huh, bitch? We grimoires exist to create in this world a new and just paradise. We must unite. The world demands it. Paradise. Yes, and we are so close to realizing it. Please don't go, Vice. Who's there? It's okay. I'll understand. I'll understand if you forget us. But... Promise, I won't forget you. No matter what, I'll keep the memory of Grimoire Vice alive forever. I'll chase you till the end of time, and I'll bring you back to us. Vice, please, please come back. Damn it, we need to stop him. If we don't do something, that Black Book will absorb Vice. Yes, now we shall unite in common purpose. Then the world can finally bear witness to our true power. For the last time, my name is Grimoire Vice, and it is not to be abbreviated. Vice. Good to see you, Kaine. Although I don't think anyone has ever accused me of being a little bitch before. Vice, you okay? I believe I could ask you the same question right now. Impossible. We must unite. We must become as one. I don't like you. And I want nothing to do with you. Besides, I have my companions. You're back! Of course they're weak, and they whine when I leave. Right! It's almost too much trouble. But they are my friends. I shall fight by their side. Now and forever. Vice. Thanks. And so Vice is released from Noir's control, and we have to fight Noir along with the rest of the shades left in the library. Unfortunately, the Shadow Lord is still too powerful, and Sucker punches us into not being able to fight or stop him from taking Yona. So leaving us in a situation where Kaine is still holding that previous secretary fight shade behind an unlocked door, and the only way to make it stay there is for Emil to turn Kaine along with the basement door into stone. Kaine! No more crying, okay? <laughs> Grow strong. Never lose hope. Vice. Spare me the goodbye, hussy. I imagine it will take more than this to kill you. <sighs> I doubt it. Wait for me. 
Joo. Villa pa. Käin ei. I swear. <laughs> <laughs>